investing in middle markets. Fifth Street Finance is on the lookout for small and mid-sized companies that it believes are worth lending to. And with an active mergers and acquisitions market this year, a lot of deals happening, a lot of people looking for finance. So this has been a pretty big growth period for the company. And that's good because my next guest is Fifth Street's chief executive, Len Tenenbaum. Len, good to have you with us on Bloomberg again. Oh, thanks Always for having me. Always a pleasure. So give us an update. What is, what is going on in this? Define the middle market for us. And that's sometimes used as a proxy for the health of the U.S. economy. It certainly is. The middle market typically is between five and twenty-five million dollars of EBITDA, and EBIT EBITDA, earnings. Yeah, that's earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. Thank you. Basically, cash flow of a company. Uh, these are companies the size of about a hundred million in revenue, and these small companies are what drives our economy. And they're growing. Even we're growing. Even we're hiring 15 people this year. So you hear that? He's hiring 15 <laughs> people. All right, everybody, get their resumes together. So the so the economy for the small, mid-sized businesses looking pretty good. It is. For the first time, I really feel that nothing else is dropping into our distress basket. We're working out our distress issues from 2007, 2008, 2009 timeframe, but nothing new is dropping in there. And what that means is the economy itself is improving, pretty much across all sectors. Now explain a little bit for those that don't know about a business development company, business development corporations, exactly what that is, because they kind of borrowed that real estate investment trust structure and applied it to lending. So we're pass-through entities like a REIT, but the idea is a dividend yield. So we want to pass through our income to investors. Typically, BDCs can uh, yield anywhere between 8 and 10 percent. I think our yields are about 9 percent. and. That's basically the point of a BDC is to make those corporate loans to middle market and small companies, collect the interest, and distribute it through to our shareholders. But of course, you've got to be careful which companies you're going to lend to and what credit facilities you're going to be buying if indeed you're going to be buying credit that is already out there in the marketplace. Absolutely. And we're known as one of the more conservative lenders out there. Uh, we have 87% of our assets in first lien loans. We still have some second lien loans in the portfolio. We don't have much equity in the portfolio like some of our peers. So I'm taking the very conservative approach. Is that the smartest approach to use in an economic expansion? Maybe not or maximize profits, but I'm scared enough through the 2008, 2009 uh, issues. And uh, I have almost all my own net worth in the company, so I'm a little bit more conservative than usual. All right, so you got your name on the door, so to speak. Uh -huh. Explain, if you can, a little bit about how the process happens. Because, you know, companies that are looking for money, they might go to a bank. Sure. They might come to you. What makes the difference? Is it about how much the money is going to cost or about how quickly the deal gets done? So I was talking, uh, quote Morgan Stanley on this, that they sort of explained to me the new role of BDCs, according to them, and I happen to agree. The banks right now are lending only to the really good credits. And I'm sure you've had, I, I saw you had some banks uh, talking about earlier on in your program. And a key corp, a Wells Fargo, our lender, our, the people we borrow from, ING Bank, uh, Morgan Stanley itself, UBS, they lend to us. We lend to the smaller companies and we diversify out the portfolio. We know how to manage those credits. We actually originate 100% of them. They feel much more company lending larger amounts of money to us, and we are the intermediary. So a BDC can stand between the banks and the smaller borrowers in terms of it really lending to small business to help them grow. And that way, the bank, if there's a problem, they know to just come to you, and they're not going to get into the details of every of little company that it's being lent to. Of course. And we're, you know, as, as we approach investment grade, that's really, they, they feel very comfortable with us as a credit, and our default rate is a rel much, much, much lower than our clients. What have you find about the credit quality of the, of the debt that you're seeing out there? Is it constantly rising? I think it's getting better because the economy is getting better. You're also talking about EBITDA trough or earnings trough, of which we're recovering from. So as you have that, the, the, our underlying portfolio continues to earn more cash and being able to amortize down its debt. The companies are getting healthier for the first time. And the banks are taking advantage of that by lending to us, and we're taking advantage by passing More that along to our the customers. More money in the system. Absolutely. All right. Talking about all right, where you get the money and what happens to the money once, let's say, a key corp comes to you and says, all right, Len, we believe in you. We believe in the way that you lend money and the way that you buy up credits in the marketplace. Do that for us, because you're going to do it in smaller slices than we're really ever able to do. What industry groups are you focused on right now? So we're still pretty healthcare focused. It's the one sector that, even through the crisis, that we did not lose one security in. 
It was really, truly amazing. And also, in underwriting the health care bill, it took us, I think we spent over $300,000 in consultants like Marwood and other great, great consultants to understand the Medicare, the Medicaid, the state reimbursement issues, where the states were trending. And all of that diligence it takes a lot of money, time, attention, and we're great. That's really what our expertise is. So maybe that's what generated such a good result. Because I've been looking at some of the deals that you've done, the lending facilities that you've provided, and a lot of it has to do with home health care. Yep. A lot of it has to do with health care record keeping. Uh, is that going to be a trend that you think is going to continue? Medical devices, health care technology, absolutely. I mean, even if the bill continues and doesn't get repealed by Congress, which, of course, I'm hopeful to, that it would get repealed. It would help our companies nicely. Um, but if it, even if it didn't, we have that budget in our assumptions. And over time, these healthcare companies are going to grow as you have the aging of the population issue. And uh, I think that's becoming more and more prevalent. In fact, the last two deals were pain management de deals. So unfortunately, a lot of people are in pain, whether it's back pain or other types of pain. Right, they've got some kind of chronic condition. It's very sad. And, and these companies, unfortunately, have a recurrent revenue stream from these people who need that, their help. Are you seeing that the competition out there for the kinds of loans that you would be making or the kinds of credits that you would be buying up, has the competition increased? Are there other investors coming into the space? So there's, three, there's only three companies that really can provide what we call a one-stop or Unitron solution. Which, and, and take down on their balance sheet a 50 to $75 million tranche and then sell it down. But us and only two others means that the competition isn't as great for that. I think what would cause our market to be much more competitive is if the CLO market opened in the middle market. Collateralized loan obligations. Collateralized loan obligations is what messed up the market in 2006 and 2007. And believe it or not, in the large market, you know, separated from the middle market, the bigger loans, the broadly syndicated loans is what that's called, um, the CLO can be up to five or six or seven times levered today. You're not seeing that in the middle market. So right now, we have this uh, perfect storm of good demand, good pricing, and not too much competition. And, and it's and you, that, that kind of lets me believe that it's conservative in the mid-market right now in terms of people's valuations. Yeah, I, th I think, well, I don't know if the valuations change that much. I think it's still between seven and eight times buying. But a seven to eight times what is the question? Is this peak EBITDA? Are we going to go into recession? Or is this trough EBITDA? Or as you EBITDA? said, in trough earnings right now, yeah, and people slowly coming, coming out of that. Talk a little bit, if you can, about the Small Business Administration, mm -hmm. because that has been a source of funds. People get a small business license, and they get approved for funds from the SBA. What's happening there? It's not so easy to get approved, but the SBA actually weeds through uh, the companies that they lend to, and we're one of them. We have a $150 million line. And next Friday, I believe, we're going to fix the $65 million of our line. The first 70-something million, I think 72 or 73, actually fixed at a all-time low at 3.2%. 3.2%. That's better than you can get for a 30-year mortgage. <laughs> Thank you, government, for helping us with that loan. And um, we'll, we'll fix another $65 million next, at the end of next week. And it's usually a spread over the 10-year Treasury. This is 10-year fixed, no recourse money. So it's a great way to borrow is, uh, fr from the government. And, you have to, and basically, we're helping small businesses grow. And, the, and I think the government's doing a good job finding other providers of capital for the SBA. Now, what about you growing your balance sheet? You just did an equity raise not too long ago. Market was very receptive to that. You got enough cash? You got enough capital right now? Or you think maybe the market keeps going higher? You might come back for a little more? So that was our largest equity raise. Yeah. We raised $145 million at 1265 Every raise we've done, and we've been on your show, been on your show for a couple of years, is successively higher. I'm not taking any connection between <laughs> the two. <laughs> but uh, I, I think as long as we can deploy capital prudently, we'll continue raising money. Um, not as often as we did in the past. We don't need to. We're approaching an $850 million market cap. So I think we're getting a lot of the benefits of size and cost of capital. Banks willing to lend to us. But also that premium to book value really allows the shareholders, every equity raise, our book value goes up. Yeah, sure, because there's more, more capital in there. What, and, and also the book value increase. Yes, sir. What, um, what do you see about interest rates? And how would that affect the business? So I'm positioning the firm, I don't maybe over positioning the firm for an increase in rates. We're over 60% floating today. We're going to 75% floating. On the way down, I was 96% fixed. Fixed. Now you want to be floating. Now you want to be floating. Get prepared.
talking about increases in interest rates has not happened yet. Right. But I say yet because so many people are looking at the health of the U.S. economy and saying eventually money has to get a little bit more expensive. What would that do to a company like yours? So we continue to position for that to occur on the way down, I mean the way down in LIBOR or rates. Uh, we were actually have had a fixed portfolio, almost 96 percent fixed. Today, as we just commented, we are 60 percent floating. I hope to get that to 75 or 80. What that means is for each percentage increase in LIBOR or interest rates, we should make more money, one, two, three million dollars. Actually, the first hundred basis points would be maybe only a million, but beyond that, it gets to be progressively more. Why? Because interest rates have to increase. It's just a matter of when. All right, so when interest rates go up, you're going to make more money because you've moved much of the lending facility to a floating rate uh, loan of some kind. Even better, and you're borrowing, like we talked about the SBA loans, $150 million. Well, that's yes, the non-recourse, right? For, fixed 10 years. Fixed. You borrow right. fixed, and lend, you lend floating. floating. That's got to work for making money in the interest rate increasing environment. What if we get a bout of inflation in addition to an increase in interest rates? I hope so. That would, that would be even better for the portfolio because that You would... and Ben Bernanke are on the <laughs> same page. He wants inflation too. You know, I think he's going to see it. What, what, what I think we're waiting for on the inflation front, remember, we have over 60 portfolio holdings. So we see some early signs of, trying, of them trying to pass through the increased cost of doing business. And I know you've heard about maybe other companies uh, increasing costs. One of the bigger increases in costs happens to be China. So China was Wage inflation, for example, right? Wage inflation is exactly right. So China took up all of the wages by about 20 percent and pretty much across the board. We experienced that in one of our Chinese companies and then had to pass through that to the consumer. And of course, as it goes down the chain, and it takes a little bit of time for wage inflation to happen. Um, that generates inflation. Even, even I had to increase for my analysts and associates. We have to increase their base salaries because even that's getting competitive here. Well, the here. coffee that they drink is probably getting more expensive. I mean, they were noting today <laughs> that, the, that Kraft has raised the price of coffee as well as Sara Lee. They're raising the price of coffee. Starbucks, Starbucks having right. to raise the price of coffee because commodities are getting more expensive. You think that that's going to change the disposition of the portfolio at all, that you see this inflation coming, that there might be companies that you weren't going to lend to before that now maybe are going to be coming to you? And we do factor that in when you underwrite and when you do an industry analysis of where do you want to focus your lending or investing. Either way, it works the same. We do buy a little bit of equity in companies. Um, how does inflation in fact affect it? For example, a restaurant chain with a fixed rate of rent. So they have fixed costs from rent, maybe for 15 years or 10 years with set escalators. If inflation hits and they're able to pass through that burger that goes from a dollar to a dollar ten, that could make McDonald's a little bit more money. Now we don't lend to McDonald's. We lend to a ten to fifteen million dollar EBITDA company or a chain, maybe a hundred to or fifty uh, chain Burger King. Right. So they get a uh, franchise. System. Franchise system. Right. But they will benefit as inflation. Because they get to pass that cost along. Absolutely. And so you have to pay attention to who you're lending to and how inflation is going to affect it. All right. Well, indeed, I just last question for you, at least right now, is when you look at the, the economy outside the United States, better or worse than what's happening here? Better growth here? So I think one of the one of the misconceptions is the United States is not going to be able to grow. It really has to be driven abroad. It has to be driven in China. It has to be driven in the BRIC countries. I'm telling you, the U.S. manufacturing is coming back and we will succeed as a country. I like the way you said that. Len Tannenbaum, Fifth Street Finance.